Assalamu alaikum, hello and good afternoon. I hope that this month of Ramadan is thus far going well for you all, inshallah. It feels good to be back. You are listening to Atiyah Ali on the Mental Health and Emotional Wellbeing Show on Ramadan Radio Wolverhampton, online on ramadanradiowolves.com. In this show, we hope to provide information that may be helpful to support your well-being and the well-being of others, because everyone's mental health matters. You can listen back to this and previous shows on Ramadan Radio's YouTube channel alongside finding further mental health information on my Twitter feed at Ali 3 We are not here to offer you advice in, in place of your clinician. However, we will share information that might encourage you to seek support. If you feel you need to discuss your health and well-being following this show, then please contact your GP. Live calls are not available on the show today as it is pre-recorded. However, you can call on, you can WhatsApp message on, apologies, 07440420432. That's 07440420432. In the show today, I'm pleased to invite Dr. Nigeth Arif, NHS GP, with a specialist, specialist interest in women's health and author of the best-selling book, The Knowledge, Your Guide to Female Health from Menstruation to the Menopause. Welcome, Dr. Nigeth Ari. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as And assalamu alaikum to all your listeners as well, and Ramzan Mubarak. Thank you. And Ramzan Mubarak to you too. Thank you for joining us. We're very pleased to have you on the show. Um, just firstly, I wanted to ask you, what interested you in this subject? The reason I do women's health is for three women in my life. Uh, the first woman is my mother. So uh, when I came to the UK at the age of nine, I became, as the eldest child in the house, the translator. Mm -hmm. for, because I was the first person to learn English, as naturally happens with, uh, for, you know, mm -hmm generation uh, migrants into the country and when I learned English I realized that actually I would be the person taken to the surgery to talk about periods and miscarriages and headaches and mm -hmm. um, hair loss and uh, problems with sort of chest or coughs and colds and urine tract infections and it was when I was nearly you know 40 year old Nagat uh, now qualified as a doctor and I realized that I was translating the same things but for women mm -hmm. in my community so she was my first reason why I became really interested because women come to women. The second person is is me because even though I'm a well-educated individual in this country uh, and I'm a doctor who works in the NHS, there are a lot of health inequalities, which means that being a woman of colour, I'm not seen or I'm not heard within the healthcare system. And I've had a couple of occasions myself um, where I've walked in wearing my shalad kameez and my hijab and uh, the member of staff looking at me as if I've just stepped off the boat and questioning that even if I can speak English until I start speaking and mm -hmm. I say, look, I'm actually a doctor. And the third reason, the third person I wrote this book for are um, the my sons. Mm -hmm. uh, the men in my life. I'm the sister to three brothers. I'm a daughter uh, to my father. I have a husband and I also have three boys. And um, healthcare works really well if my boys understand what I'm like. So when I wrote the knowledge, it was actually as a gift to my sons <laughs> because then they know what their mother's going through or you know the women in their lives will go through or if they decide to have children later on and if they decide if they have girls then they'll be able to support their girls because if the woman is well in the house then the whole household is well because whether we like it or not uh, patriarchy is still very strong in our cultural communities on Pakistani mm -hmm. and uh, the whole household uh, centers around the woman and she looks after sort of 95 percent of responsibilities if I can say that in the house mm -hmm. and well and the house is run well then the economy of that house thrives and that was the reason why I wrote this. Brilliant thank you for sharing that and uh, I'm sure some, most of our listeners can uh, relate to a lot of what you've said there um, I, I like in particular particular how you've mentioned that this is for the men in your family uh, and that and that's very interesting uh, and, and um, I, I hope that many of our listeners will uh, 
benefit from this. Um, Dr. Nigel, the first question I wanted to ask you was, I mean, most of us are familiar with uh, menstruation and um, uh, I suppose, you know, what comes with that. Um, however, if you want to tell us a bit more about that, that's okay. But just moving on to really asking you around uh, about menopause, what is the menopause for our listeners that don't know? The Big menopause question. is... No, it's a, it's a really lovely question because um, we need to really understand the biological journey as a woman. Men go through two biological changes. They are born and then they go through puberty and then that's about it. Unless you count midlife crisis, which actually isn't a biological change. <laughs> women, we go through three biological changes. We're essentially butterflies and we constantly change. One is, is that we are born with the number of eggs that we need. And then when we're at the right age, around 12 or 13, our biology and our genetics kick in and the level of estrogen hormone increases. And that's when we hit puberty. So puberty is when our menstruation, our periods start. And then every, on average, if you look at the average lifespan of a, of a young girl, every month um, she'll bleed and then that will continue into her fertility years. So that's when she's fertile. And then from there, she will then transition into perimenopause, menopause and postmenopause. So let's break those down. Mm. So I comes out of her biological journey from having her babies and breastfeeding. Now, she could have one baby. She could have a number of babies. I've had three. And then I've breastfed all of my babies as well. And so we, our body then regenerates and then transitions. And then when we approach around about our 40s, our periods um, change a little bit. They could become longer, heavier, less frequent. But essentially what's happening is, is we are losing the number of eggs. And as we lose the number of eggs in our ovaries, because we are on that biological journey, is that the hormone estrogen decreases. So a woman is still having periods, but then she'll have what's known as menopausal symptoms related to the lowering of the hormone estrogen. Then she'll have menopause, which is one year without a period. And postmenopause is one year and one day, and she'll remain postmenopausal for the rest of her years. And now women are living up to the age of 80 or 90. So what is the menopause? The menopause essentially is that transition from the fertility years into the lowering of the hormone estrogen. And then that brings about a, a whole host of symptoms because we have estrogen receptors everywhere. So it starts off from, if you think about it, from head to toe. So we get a whole load of psychological symptoms, and that could be anxiety, brain fog, tearfulness, low mood, um, loss of confidence, loss of self-esteem, irritability, angry for no apparent reason. And that could be cyclical because we're cyclical beings. We are monthly. Every month we change again. Our body changes and our hormones shift. We could end up getting tinnitus. We could end up getting dry mouth or a burning sensation in our mouth, hot flushes, night sweats, palpitations, aches and pains, something known as arthralgia. So head to toe pain. Um, and you could even end up getting stomach-related symptoms, breast tenderness, back pain, bloating that was never there, weight gain uh, that can happen. So we are genetically programmed to put on weight in our midlife. So around the age of 40 to 50 to about 60, we will put on a weight and then we'll start decreasing it again. Um, we might even get bladder or urinary tract infections, um, dry va vaginal irritation, uh, recurrent urine UTIs that we need antibiotics, dry skin, loss of hair, growth of hair on our face. So we get less on our head, but more on our chin. Um, and essentially, it's an all over body change that happens to us. Um, and we will have these changes that will come over sort of two to three decades of our life. Because if we start in our 40s, then we will spend the next, you know, 40 years up uh, in our menopausal phase of our life. It's now turning out to be the longest phase of our life because puberty is finite, fertility is finite, but menopause is four decades long. Wow, okay. Um, thank you so much. That's very informative, actually. And, and you've, hidden, you've talked there about lots of psychological symptoms, which I'll come back to later. But but as you were talking about that, uh, for me, I'm thinking about how fast um, the, the symptoms can be um, on, an, on an individual. So why do you think there is this taboo in, in our culture or in the Pakistani culture uh, and, and the perhaps uh, ethnic minority cultures around menopause? 
there is a taboo in a lot of cultures. Um, if you look at Chinese and Japanese, in fact, in the Chinese culture, it's the, the, the literal translation of this stage is a second spring. So they don't see it as a negative thing. And um, in the Japanese culture, the, the word is the literal translation is, is that uh, this is your next destiny. It's such a lovely, positive word. And they, in fact, they look forward to it because you have stopped your periods now and this is it's a privilege to get old and age is not seen as something to taboo and the older that you get you're more wiser because you have you know years of life experience the university of life has taught you the hard knocks um however when you come over and transit and, and look into sort of middle eastern areas um the word in arabic uh, for menopause is literally translated as the age of despair and then when you come to sort of India and Pakistan. In Gujarati, there's no word for menopause as far as I know, although I'm asking about it. In Punjabi, um, when I've looked around and the research that I've done in Punjabi, uh, the word is kapre um, khatamoge, which is you're off the rag, uh, which is so derogatory. Uh, and it's actually insulting to the woman because now women don't use rags anymore. Um, and also uh, in Urdu, it's banji, she's barren. Um, and then if you look at sort of uh, Spanish and European women, African women, there is a negativity attached just to this natural transition in life because there is no words. So when you don't have words and the lexicon to be able to communicate things like hot flushes, night sweats, because in Spanish there isn't a word for hot flush. It's actually translated as embarrassment. That's the word, literal translation. Um mm -hmm. And also we use this phase in life as a put down to other women because of internalized misogyny. Women saying to other women, well, my transition wasn't that bad. Suck it up and you should be able to do this better. So it means that everything stays beneath the curtain or beneath the blanket or in Punjabi, I, you know, I always hear, it means that when something is hidden, it becomes even more taboo. And women can't vocalize what's happening to them, which means that then they don't go to the doctor with those mm -hmm. symptoms because they trivialize them because of medical gaslighting or internal gaslighting that happens. So women will tell themselves, actually, my hot flushes aren't that bad. And it's only in my research and my qualitative data looking at cultural differences of menopause. I remember like um, I go to the mosque quite a lot. My father's the imam. And mm -hmm. I was talking women and they were complaining you know like para tak sara kuch do hai and i'd be like okay i don't understand that like medically as a western trained doctor there is no condition that causes head to toe pain mm -hmm. and then i realized they are not talking about arthritis or fibromyalgia they're talking about menopause because menopause gives you head to toe pain sir to leke para tak do hai sara kuch you know jor do hai assi uth nahi sakde subah sara sir do hai and it's because it's easier to vocalize pain because if you say to them about hot flushes the women would laugh at me and say you know stand in the 50 degree heat in pakistan you'll know what hot flush is so the context of the symptoms that's offered to the doctor is based on your reality as a patient on how severe it is and if it's not that severe then the cultural aspect is why should i bother the doctor dr nigat's got cancer and diabetes to worry about she's not going to be worried about my hot flushes but the misnomer and the problem that happens is that because we have a decrease in estrogen your quality of life gets worse uh we know that estrogen is this lovely lubricating hormone we need estrogen it looks after our brain it looks after our heart health it looks after our bone health and prevents something called osteoporosis which is thinning of the bones so it's it's knowing that this hormone that is decreasing one is is that i need you to function and carry on functioning and give you a good quality of life but also prevent you from longer term problems like heart disease and osteoporosis and osteoporosis leads to fractures which cost 2 billion pounds in the nhs and fractures happens mostly to women unfortunately as far as we know so we need to protect these women before we get to the problem yeah um thank you um dr i I'm, i'm also thinking about those those uh brothers men in the community who support their wives i'm wondering whether you see those people come to your surgery where they're saying you know um our partner pat their their partner wife cannot speak english perhaps or they've recognized there's been some changes I'm just wondering if you have any of that i do and 
actually sometimes a diagnosis of menopause because we don't have a word in our language do we so we don't have the lexicon and as brothers uh, anyone that's listening or as sons as husbands as uncles as fathers of daughters who might go through early menopause because remember menopause doesn't just happen in older women one in a hundred women will go through menopause below the age of 40 and that's known as primary ovarian insufficiency the youngest that i look after in my clinic she's 15 years old mm -hmm. and she ended up going through menopause at a very young age because mm -hmm. we don't know what the cause is but we do know that this happens in communities as well. There's also chemical menopause. So if you've had breast cancer and then we give you chemotherapy, we block your estrogen receptors and then that pushes you into early menopause as well. And if you've had, say, surgery to have your ovaries removed, again, you can be pushed into early menopause at any age because of that surgery and that can push you into surgical menopause. So menopause isn't just defined by age, it's also defined by lots of other things. And if any fathers, brothers, husbands are listening, I'll just tell you a really quick story. I had a Pakistani gentleman who I was looking after, I work in Slough, mm -hmm. and I couldn't manage his blood pressure. He would come in all the time, he worked as a taxi driver, and he was like, my blood pressure is not Dr. Saab, I'm doing everything. And he was great, his diet was really well, and now I'm coming on to the third line of high blood pressure tablets. And it took us about the seventh consultation for him to gain his trust of me. And then I said, to him, is everything OK at home? And he, for the first time, said to me, after I've known him for a couple of years of managing his blood pressure, said to me, actually, things aren't great. My wife complains of talaki. She's always got palpitations. We don't sleep in the same bed together anymore. She's angry. She's irritable. I hate coming home. And I looked at sort of his wife's notes really quickly and I realized that she was probably around the age of 55 and sort of around menopause age. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, I said to him, I think she might have menopause. And he goes, I don't know what that is. Menopause And I said, well, this is what it is. It's, a, it's when your hormones decrease and bring your wife in. And lo and behold, she did have that condition. And after many consultations, I started on hormone replacement therapy and she got better and his blood pressure came down. So <laughs> that yeah. just shows like no the, benefits. there are so many benefits because if uh, stress and anxiety and mental health implications of a biological transition has so much impact on those that you live with. And so actually the diagnosis from my community comes from the men. The men will bring the women because they are fed up and they want to support the women that they absolutely love and adore. You know, we're talking at the time of Ramzan and, you know, it's the women that will get up at Seri and she will make the food. She will be the one who will make her thari. I mean, I do this in my house as well. So I need to be well to be able to do all of those. And if I'm not well, then actually it's the basics that's like people being fed in the house won't happen. And so we've got to get the fundamentals right. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and thinking along those lines, you've talked a little bit about hormone replacement therapy. And again, we'll have a little talk about how you treat um, menopause or help people with menopause um, after the break, if that's OK. But j just to stick at, at the subject of symptoms, you, you mentioned kind of pain, um, brain fog, etc. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you meant by brain fog? The brain fog is the sensation that you can't remember conversations or follow conversations or you're forgetful. It, it, it's a bit like walking through a misty cloud. Every single time you wake up in the morning, either you feel that you haven't slept the best sleep, and that also happens as well in the menopause or perimenopausal um, stage of your life, mm -hmm. but also that you become slightly more clumsy as well. Um, one of my patients came to see me convinced that she had dementia because she worked in a high-powered job as a solicitor, and now that she found herself putting her car keys in the fridge, at the end of the day and then couldn't find mm. a car and actually those were symptoms of brain fog um for many many years in fact decades we used to gaslight women and say no 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 brain fog isn't a thing it doesn't happen or being clumsy uh, i know definitely just before my own period happens that i've scratched my car many a times my husband won't listen to this so this is good so <laughs> <laughs> So clumsy. And that's because um, our brain uh, takes over the function of making estrogen. So we are genetically programmed to make estrogen in three different places. So this is very sort of loosely explained, but in our ovaries as women, 
uh, in our fat cells, we produce sex hormones, so estrogen and testosterone, and our brain produces estrogen. And we've only recently realized it also produces testosterone as well. But our brain is so clever. It also produces melatonin, which is our sleep hormone, serotonin, which is our happy hormone. It also produces cortisol, which is our stress hormone as well. And then adrenaline and noradrenaline, you know, our fight and flight hormones. So if you think about the fact that when estrogen is lowering, your brain goes, what's happened? I hormone. It's lovely. It was lubricating everything and it was keeping things going. And so what your brain does is sends a signal to the fat cells and goes, do you remember when she started her periods and we needed that puppy fat? Can you please produce hormones again from your fat cells? Because we need that fat to produce the hormones. But now we're in our midlife and we don't want to get fat because we are at risk of type 2 diabetes. So the brain also then kicks out melatonin, which is our sleep hormone. So our sleep is knocked off mm-hmm. and we f- struggle to sleep. And that's why we get these tiny micro thermoregulatory issues where we get hot flushes and night sweats. And then you wake up in the morning and you feel that you haven't had a full night's sleep and you're irritable and you're angry and the psychological symptoms of tearfulness, irritability, low self-esteem, low self-confidence. Some women say to me, I just feel like I've lost my joy. I'm not the same person that I used to be. Yeah. And, and so it absolutely makes sense because as your brain is trying to make estrogen, it increases your cortisol level, which is your stress hormone. So there are actual biological reasons and um, the clinical pathways that show us why our body goes through the flux at this stage. And it can be a decade long flux um, where these symptoms come and go because your body constantly is genetically programmed to get you back to normal. So it will continuously try and repair, but it can't always do it to the level that Mm. you want. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, it's very interesting. We have a couple of minutes before we, we go into the break. I just want you to quickly ask you about what are the, those people who say, well, our body is naturally supposed to be doing this, so we shouldn't be getting artificial support for it. There was no support in the past and it shouldn't be the case now. We should just let our body do what it wants to do naturally. And bearing in mind, we've got a minute or so, we can pick it up again after the break. I have an issue with naturally because you could say cancer is natural. It's our body's mistakes of its own cells, which overgrow. But we would, why do we have a a complete pathway and treatments and multiple surgeries and chemotherapy and radiotherapy and screening and a whole infrastructure set up for something that naturally happens in your body. Um, And I think that uh, there are two things that I would say is that um, natural doesn't always mean that it's good. Um, And secondly, um, we as human beings are put on this earth to thrive, not just to survive. And if you can thrive by a little bit of support, by us giving you back hormones that you need through root vegetables and yams and soya, then that's brilliant. And we can do that. And that's known as HRT. And then that's much, much safer. And in the past, so the question is, but my grandmother and my mother's never complained. It's because mm. they did the treatments and they didn't have the words and the lexicon and the education and the research. So we now know that you can treat cancer as a chronic disease. Women survive breast cancer and live 20, 30 years after breast cancer completely well. um, Mm. And they don't die anymore. Why? Because of advancements and communication and research. So it's exactly the same. We want women to continue thriving because you've done your dues, you've had your periods, you've had your babies, multiple babies, God forbid you had miscarriages. And then suddenly like, I'm done with my periods. And what now I've got osteoporosis, which is something that I could have prevented. And now I've got heart disease, knowing I could have prevented this. Mm, mm. That's where I feel it's just so much injustice. And this is where you shared the importance there. Thank you so much. Please stay tuned in. We're just going into a break. See you on the other side. Eurofit Auto Centres, the leading MOT and service centres in West Midlands, are recruiting technicians, MOT testers and managers. There's a starting salary of £30,000 based on experience and a minimum five years experience is necessary. For details, call Rashad at Eurofit Auto Centres on 01902 404045. That's Eurofit Auto Centres on 01902 404045. Northern Gas Heating, celebrating 24 years of reliable heating and renewable energy solutions for your home. 
we have unbeatable offers on gas boilers, fully installed by our professional engineers. If your business or home is paying high electricity prices, call for a free Northern Gas Heating quote for cost-effective solar PV with battery storage. Visit northerngasheating.com or call 0800 083 1000. Ramadan Kareem from Premier Tyres. Suppliers of the tyres you can rely on for safe driving as they're the only link between your vehicle and the road. And as well as leading tyre brands, Premier is your reliable go-to garage for servicing, spares, repairs and MOTs. Now available, Wolverhampton Taxi Plated Cars for Hire. Now Uber and Bolt ready so you can run your business in confidence. For details, visit Premier Tyres Crown Street WV1 1PX. Call 01902 455 684 or visit premiertireservices.com. Experience the AK Windows difference. Visit our HQ at Economic House, Salisbury Street, Wolverhampton, WV3 OBG. Discover quality UPVC and aluminium windows, doors, roof lanterns, bifolding doors and composite doors in various styles. Offering glass and UPVC repairs too. With over 30 years of experience, AK Windows is your trusted choice for both trade and retail. For free quotations, call 01902 421 500 or visit akwindows.co.uk. Elevate your living with AK Windows. Precision, quality, satisfaction. Midland Plastics and Plumbing Limited, your one-stop shop for home and bathrooms. A wide range of plumbing products and quality bathroom supplies in Wolverhampton. We supply underground drainage, guttering, roofing products, UPVC cladding and much more to the trade and public. This Ramadan, we're offering 40% off all bathroom suites. Visit us online at midlandplasticsltd.co.uk or call us today on 01902 399 611 or why not visit in-store at Moore Street South, Wolverhampton, WV2 3JN. Mubi, Base Electronics, specialist in car audio and home entertainment. Suppliers of leading brands, Samsung, Sony, and Panasonic. We supply and fit all car audio systems, top brands, Kenwood, Bose, and we're an authorized supplier of Vibe products. Visit our store online at mubibase.co.uk and order today for next day delivery. Mubi Base Electronics are proud sponsors of Wolverhampton Wanderers FC. Call us today for a free quote on 01902-754-546 and quote Ramadan 20 for 10% off. Follow us on Instagram. Instagram and Facebook at Movie Base Electronics, specialist in car audio and home entertainment. Khan Builders offer a full range of building services from major rebuilds to small projects, home improvements, kitchen fitting, plastering, bathroom fitting, extensions, and much more. We pride ourselves on providing a professional, caring, and high quality service and always meet our customers' needs. Contact Khan Builders today on 07813 950 265 for a free quotation from Khan Builders. We've all spent a lot of time at home lately, and it's time to notice those carpets really need replacing. Let's be honest, we don't want to go from shop to shop, do we? Well, Perfect Carpets can save you the time and bring perfection to your floor. Over 1,000 high-quality styles and colours. Carpets start from only £3 per square yard. Rugs from £30. There's free measurements and free quotation with exclusive trade discounts to landlords and builders. You can't get any more perfect. Make your home with Perfect Carpets, the Black Country's biggest carpet store. Call us today on 01902 428 833 or visit us at 21 to 25 Snow Hill, Wolverhampton, WV2 4AD and quote Ramadan Radio for 5% off your next order. Quick Build Construction Limited offer a full range of building services from major rebuilds to small projects, home improvements, kitchen fitting, plastering, bathroom fitting, extensions and much more. We pride ourselves on providing a professional, caring and high quality service and always meet our customers' needs. Contact Quick Build Construction today on 07813 950 265 for a free quotation from Quick Build Construction. 
Do you have a family member that's passed away and you would like someone to assist you in legal advice? Kenneth Jones Solicitors has been providing legal services for businesses and individuals since 1986. We specialize in probate, Islamic wills, and family law. We also offer services in conveyancing, immigration, and personal injury. Contact us today on 01902 or visit us on our website at kenneth-jones.co.uk. Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome back um, to the emotional well, mental health and emotional well-being show. You're listening to Adhya Ali and we have our guest who is a resident doctor on the BBC and ITV's This Morning. Welcome back, Dr. Nigger. Hi, thank you so much for Brilliant. Before the show, uh, before the break came, we were thinking about and um uh, about the taboo around seeking support and thinking about natural and herbal remedies around menopause. Uh, and you you shared how important it is to actually seek support and that we have the means to seek support and, and the help is out there. Can you tell us a little bit more about this help that is out there? What can women, where can women get the support and what kind of um, medical interventions are available? There's so many places that you can get support. Um, there's now health content creators. So I work with the World Health Organization and YouTube Health, and I produce free content in different languages um, on my YouTube channel in Urdu and Punjabi about menopause. So you can always look at those. Um, the NHS website is uh, a free resource, which has got brilliant uh, information about what you're entitled to and what you should be looking out for and treatments for the menopause, as well as the nice guidance. So if you're thinking that your doctor's not listening to you, then I would say um, a very, very quick thing to do is that read the NICE guidance um, from 2019 when they were last updated and take those to the doctor. Um, and that's because currently, as it stands in the UK, not all doctors do women's health. It's a choice that you have to go away and specialise. And about 12 years ago, just over a decade ago, I went away and specialised and did special courses in women's health. So I insert coils. I also do hormone replacement therapy and I talk about menopause. And then the other place to look for great information for cultural nuances and Pakistani, South Asian, black women is my book, The Knowledge. Uh, your guide mm. to the menstruation to the menopause because it's the first book that's got women of color about advice about Ramzan what you can do about your HRT as well written in partnership my father because he's the imam which is really handy um, mm. also uh, it's got uh, things like vulval lichen sclerosis so pictures of what it actually looks like because women unfortunately can either get fobbed up or misdiagnosed so those are the areas and places that you can look for for support mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and when a person has put up the thing to speak to a doctor, um, should they be listening or specifically would that depend on the outcome of the appointment? So in terms of if it's brain fog, would that be a different medication? How does it work? So no, we don't treat individual symptoms. We mm. treat pump of symptoms. So um, if you are thinking, actually, some of the symptoms that Dr. Nigatha said today might be me and I've got perimenopause or menopause, I would say, number one, please keep a symptom diary. There's an app called the Balance app that you can download. It's for free. And you can start tracking your periods and your symptoms because not all the symptoms will come at once, like I reeled off earlier. They will come hodgepodge and you have to be your own detective. Nobody knows your body better than you do. So please, please, please keep a symptom diary diary so that you're prepared number two book an appointment at your gp surgery but ask the receptionist who does menopause at the practice because it might not be your registered doctor it could be the nurse practitioner or it could be a locum doctor that's in who does women's health then number three take your symptom diary to your appointment which you've booked because it's a double appointment and then take along a partner or someone who can advocate if you're not very good with your english um, who can translate for you or um, i find that friends or work colleagues if you can bring them with you because they could bring, give you a bit more support and provide the doctor with a collateral history um, and then number four don't expect hormone replacement therapy or treatment or a prescription on the first consultation a good doctor should be looking at all the symptoms and going okay i need to rule out type 2 diabetes i need to rule out cardiovascular disease i need to rule out mental health i need to rule out 
um, hypothyroidism or hyper. So we need to make sure that the symptoms, because they overlap with so many different conditions, uh, are ruled out. And then number five, as you're leaving the practice and the doctor's sending you off for some blood tests or tests to make sure that there's nothing else, then book a, a follow-up appointment because as it stands in the NHS, mm. you are responsible for continuity of care. You will be given any doctor and if you don't mind any doctor, then that's okay. But if you want to see Dr. Nigath again because you liked her appointment and you've got a plan with her, make sure you book six weeks in advance because then you will see the same doctor and have all your results. Because for women over the age of 45, we don't do tests for female hormone testing. It's not advisable and actually they're not accurate and NICE says you don't need to do them. For women below the age of 45, if you remember, I said that there's one in 100 women who go through early menopause, we might want to do follicle stimulating hormone so then once we get all the tests then we look at your lifestyle we look at your diet we look at yoga pilates acupuncture there's great evidence-based medicine for that you might want to try some herbal medicine so i'm a huge fan of herbs so ashwagandha which is like this root uh, root that you can take to help with hot flushes um, you might want to try say black cohosh but you've got to be really careful with black cohosh because it can cause liver toxicity so not all herbs are equal and you have to be really careful that if you are going down the route of herbs, that you talk with your herbalist and it's got the trademark, um, the regulatory body from the herb regulatory system that's on the herbs. So not just anything that you're buying off the Internet. Mm. And then uh, the first line treatment for psychological symptoms, so mental health symptoms, and physical symptoms of the menopause is hormone replacement therapy. Those are three letters, HRT, which are literally things that we use to replace back your hormone, your estrogen, so that your brain doesn't have to do all the work to try and function to produce estrogen from you. And so all we do is we give you back that estrogen. Right. Thank you. Um, you mentioned there something around uh, the overlap between uh, mental health and uh, menopausal menopause symptoms. Um, can you tell me a bit about that? Because I know in my line of work, we have many people coming al along with um, increased um, psychological distress, which, you know, I, I do. Some people do ask and, and, and uh, inquire around menopause and uh, time of the you know month having your menstruation etc um, and people are quite open and welcome that conversation but how would you encourage people like professionals like myself and other health professionals to to bring that room into the uh, to bring that question into the room and also what what is the overlap the overlap is actually really narrow margins so the symptoms of say low mood or depression or anxiety or even bipolar can overlap so much with symptoms psychological symptoms of say perimenopause or menopause and a good doctor a good clinician like yourself you should be thinking down the route of say mental health symptoms so if you've got a patient who's coming in who's complaining of anxiety palpitations lack of sleep feelings of guilt feeling of doom then you can do what's, what's known as a phq9 um, or a had scale so that's a questionnaire that i use to rule out any mm -hmm. mental health and then you should also be thinking with her age and her menstrual history. So take a very good menstrual history um, or gynae history and then be thinking along the line of perimenopause and menopause. But then also you should be thinking about thyroid as well, because we know that women are twice more likely or three times more likely to get autoimmune conditions and lowering of your thyroid hormone, which is uh, produced by this gland, which is at the back of your neck, a uh, butterfly gland uh, called the thyroid gland, then lowering of that can also cause psychological symptoms. So uh, that's why we use something, I'm sure you know this, called a differential diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So when I have a patient in front of me, you don't become blinkered. Um, you know that the symptoms overlap so much. Therefore, you're going down your sort of differential diagnosis. Is it mental health? Is it anxiety? Is it bipolar? Is it depression? What grade of depression is it? And you discuss that with either doing a PHQ-9 or a symptom history because there are no blood tests for depression or blood tests for, mm -hmm. say, anxiety. Then you're going to go down and go, well, is it a thyroid? Well, I can do a blood test for that and check your thyroid. Could it be that she's anemic because she's mentioned that her periods have become really heavy and anemia can cause fatigue, anxiety, irritability? Is it that she's perimenopausal? Well, she's coming to 45, 48 years old. She's mentioned that her periods have changed or they are becoming more spaced out or she's not had a period in a year. So that's what we should differentiate. The person has to come as a whole, not as just a singular diagnosis.
And in your line of work, do you regularly or routinely um, refer on to psych- for psychological support alongside um, a physical health support if, if, if a person is presenting um, with um, perimenopause, for example? Yeah. So the person can um, self-refer to talking therapies on the NHS mm-hmm. because there are great evidence-based data to suggest that talking therapies or cognitive behavioural therapy works really well. Uh, there's a brilliant book, which I would advise anyone listening to this to get. It's about seven pounds on Amazon by Myra Hunter called How to Manage Hot Flushes with Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. Cognitive behavioural therapy is an umbrella term. And it's not that you think you're hot flushes away, but there is 10 years data to show how um, you can actually manage your hot flushes, your irritability, your mood swings, your anxiety, uh, your tearfulness, your lack of motivation, low self-esteem, confidence, loss of joy, um, all of those things by doing effective cognitive behavioral therapy. And I definitely refer my patients. For some of my patients, they've tried that and it doesn't work. And then I say to them, acupuncture, there's evidence-based data to show on multiple trials that acupuncture works brilliantly for psychological symptoms of the menopause, yoga as well, and strengthening exercises. So when you do strengthening exercises like weightlifting, um, that increases your bone stability and also your muscle structure. And your muscles is where you produce serotonin. So actually, you should be exercising for your sanity and your mental health more more over your vanity, so your weight, et cetera, because that's a secondary thing. And we need to get around the fact that exercise is brilliant for mental health. And then if my patient still says to me, look, I'm doing all of that, Dr. Nigat, and I'm working really hard, then I say to them, well, first line treatment for menopausal symptoms is hormone replacement therapy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, you mentioned there uh, around uh, the holistic approach. I mean, I, I found that very interesting, and especially in our lines of um you know areas of uh, specialities um the holistic approach is sometimes missed uh, and in particular spirituality and the impact on on your well-being is that brought into the into your consultations or is that in, mentioned in your book can you tell us a bit about that it's mentioned extensively in my book it's not brought into my consultations because mm-hmm. not in the nice guidance to talk about spirituality <laughs> absolutely <laughs> um but uh, I am a practicing Muslim. Uh, like I say, I, you know, I'm the daughter of the imam. So faith is a huge part of my life. Mm-hmm. And, um, I don't think that you can extract faith away from a sort of mental well-being. And meditation is essentially a form of a faith practice. Mm-hmm. And the data time and time again shows that faith can be used in two different ways. Uh, one is, is that um, it can be used as a, a stick to say, well, pray hard enough and then Allah will forgive you because you must have done something wrong and sinful to get the symptoms that you're getting, which is actually yeah. not. I believe at all but unfortunately communities do use that to keep people within a cockfold of making sure that they toe the line and And this is what I meant by bringing it into the consultation room do they come in and talk about the fact that you know they no longer want to pray etc yeah Um, And we use that mostly, if you look at the data, we use that mostly for women because we are a patriarchal and misogynistic society, unfortunately. So um, I think that uh, faith does have a role, but if it... uh, errs onto the side where we almost become fatalistic so it's almost like it's god's will it's allah's will this is going to happen and you deny yourself medical care then that is actually negligent you know negligent Mm. and really awful and we shouldn't be promoting things like that on the flip side uh, faith with great medical intervention uh, works really well i mean i still pray every day um and i pray for my patients and for me that brings me that's the only thing i can do in a world which is so ugly and severely damaged that i can't change anything um and when it comes to that the only way i can reason with uh, the fact that the world is so ugly is the and traumatic uh, is the fact that there is, has to be a higher being for me that's allah who will protect people and justice will be done at some point. And so for some patients, it can actually provide them the solace that they need for their psychological well-being. Absolutely. And now is a more important time than ever for people who have these symptoms to, to try and seek some support. 
Yes, absolutely. And I don't think that um, you should ever deny yourself because even if you look at the teachings, you know, Allah says there's a treatment for everything and you have to seek it. You can't just rely on me. You have to do the work as well. And mm -hmm. so I think Ramzan is a great time where you can refocus and look at just not your spiritual health, but your mental well-being, but also your physical health and the, the triad of spirituality, uh, mental and physical health for me is the 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 holy grail the, the the magic as a clinician and that's why i do believe as a clinician um that uh faith whatever faith that might be not just islam it could be whatever faith that mm -hmm. you practice the role in our well-being mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um talking al along those lines and just uh, thinking about the medication you, you talked earlier about and uh, forgive me if i pronounce it incorrectly follicle was it uh, simulated hormone yeah. Um, so this the medication that you you uh, or GPs might might prescribe. Is it uh, is there only one type of medication? Is it a pill a day? I mean, how does it work? And just for those people who might be interested in knowing more around that. Yeah. Um, so I do cover this with pictures and tables and mm -hmm. explain exactly what's available on the NHS in my book really thoroughly. Um, and so it's really important to know that there isn't just one type. So we have about. 13 different types of estrogen, about four or five different types of progesterone, the marina coil, which acts as your progesterone component as well, and also protects the lining of the womb. We also have topical vaginal estrogens, and there's about eight different types of those. So we have something called known as systemic hormones. So systemic means going throughout the whole body, um, and that will be your patches, your gels, your sprays, and then tablets like Utrogestan. And then you can have a coil, which will also look after you systemically. And then topical vaginal estrogens, which only work in and around the vagina and the vulva and the bladder to protect you against dryness, urinary tract infections, soreness, etc. And you can use systemic, so something that's going to go throughout your whole body, um, and a localized vaginal estrogen together. Um, and both of them have completely different risk profiles. So if you're going to have something that goes throughout your whole body, we then would risk assess you in regards to family history of breast cancer, your personal history of breast cancer, um, your weight, uh, if you're a smoker, if you drink alcohol, which might not be your audience, but I still mention it. Um, it also, it'd be really important to know if you've ever had a history of clots, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, history of osteoporosis. So what, what a good doctor should be doing is what I do with my patients. So I'll go through their, all their risk versus benefits and then find that actually the majority of my patients, the benefits of having their hormones given back to them because it's a hormone deficiency, the benefits of that happening means that the risks are lower because their quality of life increases. You lose weight because now by giving you estrogen back as a gel, so a gel goes through the skin on your thigh, um, it talks to the fat cells in your body because it gets absorbed through the skin and says to your fat cells, mate, I'm here, don't worry. That alleviates the pressure from the brain going, I need to make estrogen. So actually it stops your fat cells that you're genetically programmed to do to get bigger. So you'll notice in about a year to two years down the line that you actually start losing weight on hormone replacement therapy because mm -hmm. you're, you're now replacing, your bone quality gets better. Your risk of type two diabetes decreases. Your risk of bowel cancer decreases. Your risk of heart disease decreases. Your risk of dementia, the data is showing decreases because your brain isn't working so hard to, to get that hormone back. Mm -hmm. And there's another hormone called testosterone, which we're understanding more and more. And this is also available on the NHS and you have to ask for it, is that um, it can help with bone strength, brain health, psychological symptoms, uh, your energy levels. So as a, a good doctor like me, <laughs> I say I'm a good doctor, but, you know, you it's not... That. <laughs> But it's not one size fits all. Um, if I'm completely honest, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I work in the NHS, but if I see 10 women, uh, Pakistani, Asian, black women, you know, white women, Caucasian women, if I see 10 women from different backgrounds mm -hmm. and I start them on a HRT regime, it will take me three years to tweak the dose, the type, how much they need, when they need it. And we do this tweaking process because it's not one size that fits all. Hmm. So it sounds as though your book, The Knowledge, will be really helpful um, for, um, you know, the average person like myself to understand which medication might be suit best suited for us and the questions to ask when we have a GP appointment. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to ask a little bit. I mean, this might be, you might have an obvious answer for this, but there are people that I'm aware of, in fact, people who have um, come to my clinic as also in terms of uh, therapy appointments and talked about um, hysterectomy and not had any HRT support for years. So they say, oh, but we've been without it for decades and, you know, we're at 70 and we don't need to look into HRT and it might not be affecting my mood. This is something else. So um, what would you say to, to those um, patients, clients, people? So it's really important to look as have they had a hysterectomy, but their ovaries were still left behind. If their ovaries were still left behind, then they would have been getting some replenishment back with their hormones. If their ovaries taken that's known as surgical menopause and i think it's scandalous actually you should sue the doctor for not putting you on hrt uh, imagine if it was a man and we took away his testes and we never replaced his hormones that'd be awful mm. you know the the level of negligence that we have for women's health is is astonishingly crazy and that's and medical specifically medicine. specifically for people who have a cultural language barrier exactly you know, this a lot I'm working a lot on that. Uh, one way is my book, but also I'm working on the women's health strategy. And I, I've formulated something called the Health Collective, which is actually looking and working with marginalized grassroots communities who already have that trust, who are able to educate their women in their communities to say, you know, if you've had your ovaries removed, you need to go to the doctor and ask for hormone replacement therapy because mm -hmm. it might not really happen. Because the way the system is set up is that the gynecologists think that the GP will start you on HRT and the GPs think, well, the gynecologist should do it. And so it's where does the funding land? And so no one does it. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have to advocate for yourself, which is why I make free content on the internet for women to look at and my TikToks and my social media. And it's not just me. Lots of us are doing it because we realize and the government realizes that the women's health is so dire in this country, especially for marginalized uh, groups who don't have English as a first language and also from black and Asian communities. And even more widely, if you're, say, from an LGBTQ plus or if you are hard of hearing or if you're visually impaired or if you've got a neurodiversity like ADHD or autism, you're going to even be more neglected uh, because you can't navigate yourself around the NHS systems and the pathways. So in that case, if you had a woman, I would say if you had your hysterectomy, then your ovaries were removed. You should definitely be asking about estrogen and you should definitely be asking about testosterone and your GP or your gynecologist should be helping you with that. But also you should also not just think beyond uh, psychological symptoms you have to think about the physical vulval uh, genitourinary syndrome or the menopause so mm. it's an area that gets neglected so much in our culture and it's because if if anything if you're like me i see a lot of women in their 60s and 70s pakistani ladies who were never offered hrt didn't even know anything about it but now i'm seeing them with recurrent urinary tract infections prolapse increased frequency of urine they haven't gone to their last smear because it was so painful when they had their smear they end up getting um urgent urgent frequency uh, so if they need to go they'll go they'll not go to weddings or you know in ramadan far because they just cannot hold on to their wee and do their vuzzle um and they constantly get infections and the whole reason that happens uh, especially urine infection, which lands them in hospital and they get admitted for, you know, the third line antibiotics now is because they had a lack of estrogen and they've been without estrogen in the vulval area and the vaginal area for over two or three decades. Right. And we should be starting women and the data has shown this time and time again in their 40s and 50s and educating them to go, please use a vaginal moisturizer. So just like you moisturize your face, you need to moisturize that bit of skin as well because it keeps nice and plump and healthy and preserves that barrier so you don't get urinary tract infections. So your vuzzle will stay and then you can keep on praying. You should also be telling women in their 40s and 50s, please start using topical vaginal estrogen. So I'm 40 and I use topical vaginal estrogen low dose twice weekly. Uh, and it's only because I'm now hitting the perimenopause and I realise I've got to start looking after that area because I still need to go for smears. I don't want to get a prolapse after my three children. A low yeah. dose vaginal oestrogen prevents me from urinary tract infections, which were my first sign that I'm actually going into the perimenopause. It wasn't the psychological signs for me. It was the urinary syndrome of the menopause. So this is why it's so important that women understand it's an all over body condition. And we hear that passion, Dr. Nigadar. If it's been a pleasure having you on the show, we, we've come to the end of the show and quite quickly, actually. Um, and I, I encourage everyone to go away and buy your book, The Knowledge. Um, 
we're now coming to the end of the show. It's been very informative and I'm sure some listeners might be encouraged to consider buying your book uh, and to speak to their GP about their symptoms. Um, where can people contact you on if they want further information? You've got three seconds to tell us. Thank you, Dr. Nigatawi. I'm everywhere on socials at Dr. Dr. Nigat Arif, uh, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. Yeah, that's the best way. Brilliant. Thank you for joining us today. Kadafi and happy Ramzan. Ramzan Mubarak. Thank you again for tuning in today and do listen back to this and uh, the clips. Uh, my show is here next Saturday at one o'clock with more exciting guests.